family here. So this is the second part of the North Africa campaign, 1941. This is the siege of Tobruk. So the siege of Tobruk, all right, is a confrontation that lasted. It lasted actually for 241 days between Axis and Allied forces in North Africa. During the, this is of course during the Western Desert Campaign. Um, and this is, of course, the siege started on the 11th of February, 1941. So this is early in 41, when Tobruk was attacked by an Italian uh, and the Italo-German force under Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel. And it continued for 100, or sorry, 240 days up to the 27th of November, 1941 when it was relieved by the Allied 8th Army during Operation Crusader. So, it was vital for the Allies' uh, defense of Egypt and the Suez Canal to hold the town with its uh, its harbor as this, force, uh, this forced the enemy to bring most of their supplies over land from the port of Tripoli across 1,500 kilometers. Imagine. Uh, now, that's 1,500 kilometers of desert, mind you. As well as diverting troops from their advance, Tobruk was subject to repeated ground assaults and almost constant shelling and bombing. The Nazi propaganda called the uh, tenacious defenders rats, a term that the Australian soldiers embraced as an ironic compliment. For much of the siege, Tobruk was defended by the reinforced Australian 9th Division under Lieutenant General Leslie Moorhead, Morsehead. General uh, Archibald Wavell, Commander-in-Chief of British Middle East Command, instructed Morsehead uh, to hold the fortress for eight weeks, but the 9th Australian Division held it for over five months before being gradually withdrawn during September and replaced by the British 70th Infantry Division, the Polish Carpathian Brigade, and Czechoslovak 11th Infantry Brigade, or Battalion, sorry, East under the overall command of Major General Ronald, uh, Scob uh, Ronald Scobie. The fresh defenders continued to hold Tobruk until they were able to link with the advancing 8th Army at the end of November um, during Operation Crusader, and I will eventually get to Crusader, whether it's in this presentation or the next one. I've got a lot to go through, and I'm going to get through the main Tobruk um, operations tonight. The Tobruk Ferry Service, made up of uh, Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy warships, played an important role in Tobruk's defense, providing gunfire support, supplies, fresh troops, and ferrying out the wounded. Maintaining control of Tobruk was crucial to the Allied war effort. Other than Benghazi, um, Tobruk was home uh, to the only other significant port on the North African coast between Tripoli and Alexandria. Had the Allies lost it, the Germans had um, Germans and Italian supply lines would have been drastically shortened. Um, Rommel, furthermore, was in no position to attack across the Egyptian border uh, towards uh, Cairo and Alexandria, while the Tobruk garrison threatened the lines of supply to his front line units. Tobruk marked uh, the first time that the advance of the German panzers had been brought to a halt. Following Operation Crusader, the siege of Tobruk was lifted in December 1941. Axis forces captured the fortress in 1942 after defeating Allied forces in the Battle of Gazala. Gazala. So here we have what looks to be a 25 pounder. I'm not, uh, I, I'm hoping I'm right. Anyway, this is a, a painting. Um, I think this is a 25 pounder. It looks like a 25 pounder, but I can't. It is a painting, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, but the, you can see them shooting Panzer twos and Panzer threes there. So, uh, the fall of Tobruk. So, this is overall a disaster for the British Army. They are having to, to push back, uh, pull back, and Rommel eventually takes uh, the ground. Um, so it is um, the fall of Tobruk to Rommel's Africa Corps. It, it will result in disaster for the British Army. And this is a, a problem. But of course, 
there is the second battle of Tobruk in, in 1942. So how this goes, um, City Barani, Bardea, Solom, City uh, Reza, uh, City Reza, uh, Mursa, Met, Mursa Matra, Ber, <clears throat> Ber Hachim, Il Agela, Bedafam, City Omar, Benghazi. The names of many remote villages in North Africa were written into history, 1941 and 42, as British and Axi, uh, Axis armies uh, battled back and forth across uh, the scrubby desert wastelands of northern Egypt in Libya. Yet another name became le uh, legendary in, in, Second World, in the Second World War as a symbol of he heroic and determined resistance, and that's the Siege of Tobruk. After rooting um, dispirited Italian forces in Libya during the campaign uh, to protect the vital Suez Canal and other imperial interests in the spring of 1941, the British army found itself up against far tougher opposition. And that's Lieutenant General Rommel and his newly formed uh, Deutsches Africa Corps. So the aggressive, headstrong Rommel had arrived in Tripoli that February and was eager to get at the British. Now, his orders were to recapture uh, Serenacea. Serenacea, the eastern region of Libya and its chief town Benghazi, which had been seized from the Italians by Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor on January 22, 1941. The bold, resourceful German leader, who would come to be known as the Desert Fox, had been ordered by Berlin not to start an offensive until his forces were up to strength. Nevertheless, he decided to seize the initiative with a surprise attack on the overextended British and Commonwealth forces. Rommel launched his assault on, the, on March 24, 1941, sending three mechanized columns rumbling to, uh, northward and eastward. The fast-moving Germans chased the, uh, the retreating British along the coast road, rolled into Benghazi, and swept into Bars and Derna. One panzer column captured in, inland fuel dumps and burst out onto the coastal plain in at, Gazal, um, at Gazala. Another column executed a wide flanking movement to try to capture British units evacuating from Serenacea. The Allies were in full retreat, and it seemed as if nothing could halt Rommel's advance. On the 6th of April, Allied forts, uh, fortunes reached another low point when a German motorcycle patrol captured uh, General O'Connor, one of the most capable British field commanders in the Middle Eastern Theater of Operations. Lieutenant General Philip Neem, uh, on, and so, and of course, General Lieutenant General, he was another one that was captured. And Neem is, um, is just, it's one of the major, these two are, are being lost. There's another, um, another ratchet, um, caught, you know, basically, well, this is another, um, a cog that was uh, put into the wheels of the, the British machine here. This is something certainly that, um, not only is it a, a vulnerability for them, but now that they've lost some of their, um, some of their top commanders, who are they going to replace them with? <clears throat> On April 11th, Good Friday, the Germans seized uh, Bardea, and four days later, Solom. They pushed on relentlessly eastward toward Egypt and the Suez Canal. Tobruk and uh, Evrens. So here is Tobruk. For uh, Marcusa, Aerodome. So th these are the areas here. Um, here's Derna. There's Derna. And some of the names of the villages that I have uh, talked about here. And this is the siege section through in here. And here is Tobruk here. The port. And <clears throat> so is a modern concrete fort. Through it here, you can see these um, these blocks here. There's there's quite strong forts here. Concrete strong point with anti-tank guns. 
and machine guns and that's uh, here along these different points and strong points are along here and the exterior line of strong points was connected by lines of barbed wire concertina wire and tank ditches and minefields something and sometimes they're overlapping and that is uh, to keep the Germans at bay and of course while trying to hold our guys uh, in line the 9th Australian and then and um, what British forces were left bypassing the enemy advance was the Mediterranean port of Tobruk 75 miles west of the Egyptian frontier with one of the best deep water harbors in the Mediterranean Tobruk was the only suitable port in Cyrenaica in Cyrenaica east of Benghazi as long as it was in British hands Rommel's offensive would be limited on 8th of April at a waterfront hotel in um, in the strategic port General Sir Archibald Wobble the scholarly uh, Middle Eastern uh, commander-in-chief told a group of senior officers uh, simply Tobruk must be held it would it would not be easy he warned Rama would probably make every effort to drive the defenders into the sea while the British reinforcements and supplies would have to be brought in by ship under the bombs and guns of the Luftwaffe Wavell point out on a map the few uh, remaining British units scattered across 450 miles of desert and told his officers dryly there's nothing between you and Cairo nothing between you and Cairo Wow Rommel too was aware of this as his forces pushed eastward the British stronghold at Tobruk posed a serious threat to his flank and rear its capture was to become uh, a seven-month obsession the Desert Fox told one of his divisional commanders we must attack Tobruk with everything we have before Tommy has time to dig in Tommy however had already dug in the 9th Australian Division which had withdrawn from Derna to escape Rommel's net had moved into Tobruk to reinforce British and Indian Army units already there the 200 uh, sorry the 23,000 man garrison dug in behind two old Italian defense perimeters that embraced a 20 earth uh, sorry 30 foot any tank ditch 70 strong uh, points and a minefield crisscross with barbed wire the 30 mile outer perimeter called the red line was studded with concrete um studded sorry studded studded with concrete shielded dugouts manned by machine gun and bren gun crews elsewhere in the 220 square mile Tobruk enclave the defenders waited with their 26 ton Matilda infantry tanks the Matilda 2s which I've talked about 25 pounder field guns and heavy anti-aircraft batteries the garrison commander was the resolute Major General Leslie J Morshead leader of the Australian division and a disciplinarian who was known to his troops as the Ming of Merciless Merciless the Ming of Merciless that's named after uh, the villain in the Flash Gordon comic strips and serials. A former teacher in Sydney, he was a tenacious, as tenacious as Rommel. There'll be no Dunkirk here, he told his staff. If we should have to get out, we shall fight our way out. That is to be, there is to be no surrender and no retreat. The Africa Corps started its, its drive on Tobruk on Friday, April 11, 1941 with a series of reconnaissance thrusts against the perimeter by panzers and German uh, panzer and German and, uh, and Italian infantry units these were beaten off by artillery next Rommel decided to launch a major armored assault on the southern Tobruk perimeter in the early hours of April 14th Easter that'd be Easter Monday he expected a swift victory and wrote to his wife Lucy early that day Dear Lou, today may well be the end of the Battle of Tobruk. So, of course, and, that, and that's just how it starts. So, moving toward an elaborate trap. So, at 5.20 a.m., 
supported by artillery fire and screaming Junkers, uh, Junkers, Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers. German Panthers rumbled unmolested through a gap blasted in the southern in the southern perimeter wire. The staunch, light-hearted Australian defenders huddled in the perimeter strong points made um, their huddled in the, the perimeter strong points made no attempt to engage the enemy tanks. Then, as the German infantrymen passed the strong points, a murderous fire hit them from the rear. The Panzers ground on until the leading battalion was two miles inside the Tobruk perimeter. They were moving into an elaborate trap. Suddenly, the German tank crews found themselves caught in a corridor of heavy gunfire. British and Australian units uh, field guns blasted them from both flanks at a range of only 600 yards. Clouds of dust and smoke obscured the vision of the German drivers and gunners as the Panzers milled about in confusion. Joined in the Allied barrage were two pounder anti tank guns and captured Italian coastal pieces that the resourceful Aussies had turned around to face inland. One hit uh, sheared, uh, sheared the turret of a Panzer Queen from its mountings, and a staff car was blown to bits. The Allied gunners destroyed 16 out of 38 Panzers, forcing the rest to withdraw. And this is a, a great slideshow of uh, some of the crew that are there that survived, and some of those guys didn't. Yeah, amazing. Um, for five months, we can hold on for five months in the middle of a uh, major battle like this with limited supplies. Held on. And here's some original, great original footage here on uh, some of these videos here. A German machine gun battalion suffered 75% casualties, and a panzer commander later described the action as a, a witch's cauldron. He said, We were lucky to escape alive. Rommel was furious with the outcome and fumed that his officers had lacked resolution. The Desert Fox attempted an, another assault two days later on 16th of April. This time, he took personal command and sent the Italian uh, Ariette Armored Division and an Italian Infantry Division against the Western Perimeter. The Italian tanks took refuge in Wadi, and Rommel could not induce their commanders to continue the attack. The, the Italian infantrymen took the brunt of an Australian counterattack and quickly surrendered. <clears throat> One company gave up to a British scout car crew. In all, 800 Italians were taken prisoner. The Ariat division lost at least 90% of its tanks to breakdowns. The following day, Rommel called off the attack. He still believed that he could take Tobruk but he was underestimating the, <clears throat> the fighting spirit of its defenders. Every night, 20 men allied patrols sneaked out to harass the Germans. An entire battalion of a crack um, Italian uh, Bersaglieri uh, rifle regiment was captured one evening, while an Indian army patrol returned another night with two small sacks containing 30, wow, 32, uh, 30, 32 human ears. Amazing. Jeez, that's, that's rough. For the men guarding the Tobik perimeter, concealment was vital. They stayed underground during daylight hours to escape the attention of German snipers. They swept away footprints outside their camouflage dugouts so that Luftwaffe air crews would not see the tracks. Along with the Germans the Italian and the Italians, the Allied soldiers battled heat, dust, fleas, lice, flies, dysentery, and boredom. So for the rats of, of Tobruk, and here's some of them here, the Lee Enfield rifles. The desert fleas are famous, reported a Royal Artillery Battery Sergeant, and ours were obvious, obviously in the pay of the enemy. How we uh, cursed them on nights when the moon was late up, and we hoped to catch a couple hours of sleep before the inevitable procession of night bombers started. The fleas marched up and down our twitching bodies until we, we thought we would go crazy. 
after the defenders of the stronghold um, were dismissed in Nazi propaganda as rats in a trap. They soon started calling themselves the Rats of Tobruk. The names surrounded in headlines uh, resounded in headlines throughout the British Empire. The Tobruk defenders uh, endured regular attacks by enemy bombers and Stukas, but tried to make the best of it. There was um, a shortage of fresh food and drinking water, so the troops took vitamin tablets. Some fresh water uh, was produced in ingenious uh, stills made from old gasoline drums, but the taste was always uh, sulfurous. Sulfurous, definitely. Oof. Water was rationed to six pints a day per man. The rats of Toba uh, subs um, subsisted chiefly on the old British Army standby a bully. Um, corn be bully corned beef. Uh, it was cooked in a variety of ways, from uh, rice holes, hamburgers, to hash, to uh, and augmented ca by canned stew, canned fruit, and rock hard army biscuits. Here's uh, some of the barbed wire and the crew, some of the uh, fortifications. Living quarters in the town were mainly stone houses, bomb-proof tunnels that had been dug by the Italians, and shelters uh, constructed by concrete slabs, assorted bits of wood and tin, and sandbags. The defenders kept up their morale by listening to BBC news broadcasts every night from London, which were uh, preceded by the famous chimes of Big Ben. When not manning uh, their guns against enemy raiders, they staged um, variety shows in an improvised theater. Though they gambled, um, ironed their uniforms, darkened, uh, you know, darned socks, and read their own newspaper, Tobik Truth. Each night they listened along with uh, thousands of other Allied and German troops in the Mediterranean theater of operations to broadcasts of Lael Anderson singing uh, Lily Marlin, the hunting, um, the hunting ballad about a sweetheart um, waiting underneath the lamplight by the barrack gate was the German soldier's favorite song, but became the unofficial anthem of all desert soldiers. So here's some of the um, some of the Indian um, British Indian Army unit uh, members and as well as uh, maybe Australian and British uh, forces as well um, <clears throat> a bunch of them together so now um, get, so here's a painting here this is the okay so this these are Australian uh, some of these guys are Australian Australian this is from the Australian War Memorial After receiving panzer reinforcements, Rommel planned another assault on Tobruk, a do-or-die operation. At 6.30 p.m. on April 30, 1941, the Africa Corps mounted its heaviest attack to date on the garrison. Stukas and artillery pieces pounded the Allied positions while panzers and grenadier units rushed the southwestern corner of the defenses. The defenders had been forewarned by their intelligence service but the Germans managed to gain a toehold on the outer defenses and push two miles inside the perimeter. Again, losses were heavy. The enemy failed to eliminate a number of fortified outposts manned by Australian troops who fought, uh, Rommel reported, with remarkable tendency. And... Yeah, remarkable tenacity. Even their wounded went on defending themselves uh, and stayed in the fight to their last breath. Here are some German soldiers with uh, MG34 machine guns. Uh, so, and of course these units are, and this is of course some of the German units here. These are either, I think it might be Pack 40s, Pack 38s, Pack 40s, um, field guns. Uh, and of course, these are some of the efforts showing pictures of some of the efforts uh, they're putting into attacking Tobruk. The battle raged on through the night, 
and the Allied strong points were still active the following morning. They harassed the invaders from behind as other British units retaliated with artillery and tank fire. Dust storms made tactical coordination uh, difficult for both sides. The seesaw struggle continued for three days before Rommel called off the offensive on the 4th of May. His troops retained a two-mile deep salient near Fort uh, Pilastrino for the rest of the siege, but it had been his most costly attack so far. The Afro lost more than a thousand men. Lieutenant General uh, Friedrich Paulus, who had been sent by the Army High Command to observe operations, was shocked by the casualties and the fact that the German troops were fighting in conditions that are inhuman and intolerable. He advised Rommel that there was no chance of capturing Tobruk. Well, that may be true. We'll see here, so you can see some of the British troops here. Um, one of them looks like he's got it, yep, yeah, in 1928 Thompson, um, 45 ACP submachine gun. Uh, we Enfield rifles, we Enfield number uh, three Mark ones. Um, <clears throat> number one Mark threes, rather. I always mix that up. I always, uh, I always say it either one way or another way, even though I know exactly what it is. So these are Australian troops, British and Aust British and Aussies and fighting together, but the Australians are doing doing a major amount of, of fighting here, and uh, they're gotten world recognition for this here. That's right. That's right. This is Australian War Memorial. This picture. Here are uh, some of the German troops in Rommel, um, and Italian troops. Coordinating efforts to launch attacks. The failure to siege the stronghold, the forward base Rommel badly needed for a proposed thrust into Egypt, was the Wehrmacht's first major reverse of World War II. The Desert Fox received orders from Berlin forbidding him to attack Tobruk again or from advancing further into Egypt. He was told to hold his position and conserve his forces. The hard-driving general was bitter at being uh, compelled to wage a defensive campaign. Encouraged by Rommel's unexpected setback, British troops advanced f from their defensive line in western Egypt and drove the Germans and Italians back toward the strategic uh, El Faya Pass near the port of Solom. So far, the British forces had destroyed about 300 German tanks and inflicted 38,000 casualties, twice those of the Allies. The British had been reinforced by the arrival of almost 300 tanks, dispatched in a fast convoy ordered on the orders of Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And those reinforcements are coming from down and through and here in port. Um, <clears throat> supply base here, and they're bringing up those tanks in here to assist to help support the infantry in here these tanks here near the German uh, infantry and uh, tank forces here and Rommel's uh, attacking force here trying to push in so and this is 41 or 40 what I'm talking about is 41 but of course, there is also a um, a second battle uh, in forty two that's coming up. Uh, the second battle. So for now, Tobruk still held out in fierce fighting. The British forced the Germans off a uh, Hellfire Pass and then were themselves driven off by Panzers and eighty eight uh, flat guns. Both sides suffered heavy losses. But the Africa Corps recaptured most of the territory gained by O'Connor the previous year. Tobruk, however, still held out. 823 men killed, 2,214 wounded. While Wavell's operations, uh, Bravity and Battleaxe kept the Africa Corps occupied during May and June 1941, uh, the Tobruk garrison enjoyed a welcome uh, lull. And, of course, General... Um, Moore said, um, nevertheless faced problems. His Australian brigades had lost 823 men, 
killed and 2,214 wounded and about 700 captured in the April fighting. His government demanded that the remaining troops be pulled out and reunited with other Australian units in Egypt. So in the daring night operations carried out under the noses of the enemy, most of the Tobruk garrison was replaced by fresh British, Indian, South African, and Polish troops. So they held on. And uh, starting on the moonless nights of mid-August, British um, ships ferried in troops, a tank battalion, food, and other supplies. The transports berthed in uh, darkness between... Um, the rusting wrecks of Italian ships in Tobruk Harbor were swift, and of course they were swiftly unloaded and were on their way back to Alexandria or Mursa Matra within the hour. And here's Rommel here looking over the field. After several months of relative calm, the Germans started increasing their attacks on Tobruk. This time the defenders faced the uh, scourge of 88 flat guns one of the deadliest weapons of the war. Originally used as an anti-aircraft gun, the 88 became a devastating anti-tank weapon. It could go through all, um, all our tanks like a knife through butter, reported one British soldier. So the origins for the, the German 88 gun. Okay, so the German 88's guns lineage uh, can be traced back to late 1916 when the German army first adopted... Um, the established German naval weapon for ground warfare in World War One. Machinery for producing both the barrels and the ammunition was readily available at the production field facilities of uh, both Krupp AG and Rhine Metal. The German Kriegsmarine uh, had adopted the gun largely because uh, a round of 88 ammunition was considered the largest and heaviest, about 34 pounds, that uh, a single man could handle. Of course, um, the World War I model could fire a 9.6 kilogram high explosive uh, to a height of 6,850 meters with a maximum range of 10,800 meters. Even then, the Germans relied on rudimentary trailers stabilized by folding um, outrigger arms on each side, pulled by tractors to give the guns a great degree of mobility. By late 1918, the Germans had uh, even... Um, implemented rudimentary forms of centralized fire control for the weapon. And this is all footage of the Second World War uh, system. So this system being much improved from the First World War, this is, um, of course, was widely considered the most deadly um, gun uh, the Germans had in the Second World War. I mean, um, the Flak 37, 36, 37, and 41. So... These were produced from 1933 to 1945. Um, 21,310 were built. Um, the redesign, so the, the redesign of this was, you know, the original gun was 1916, but then the, the newer design, that's where the lineage comes from, this newer design is designed in 1928. Um, of course, they had a crew of 10. Um, of course, it had, uh, the shell is actually an 88 times 571 MMR round. Um, so it's capable, it can traverse 360 degrees. Its rate of fire is about 15 to 20 rounds per minute. Muzzle velocity 840 uh, meters per second. That's 2,690 feet per second. So the maximum firing range is for anti aircraft is 8,000 meters, so 26,000 feet. Uh, maximum firing range, that, that's a maximum effective firing range, sorry. Uh, maximum firing range is 32,500 feet. So, um, so getting all this information, I'm trying to get as much of this information out there is in there as possible for uh, everybody. Um, so this design is, is an immense, immensely capable, uh, immensely used and feared by the Allies, including Canadians. Um, in the Second World War, and the Battle of the Schult, um, battles in in all throughout Europe, uh, Market Garden, uh, certainly um, Battle of the Bulge in Bastogne. If you've seen, um, if you've seen, of course, the movie uh, or the TV show uh, with the Band of Brothers, that's the uh, the miniseries in Bastogne. 
those shells coming down and with the trees exploding, those are 88s. Those are 88s. So, of course, later on, uh, this gun is certainly um, going to be fitted on the German Tiger. The Tiger, uh, of course, the Tiger 1, which will be equipped with the uh, 88 main gun. And this, and that's why it's, it's, that shows you how appreciated it is by the Germans. Uh, this, this gun is an impeccable piece of history. The Tiger does not come out in, uh, into play until 1942. So I'll be coming to the Tiger and the development of this massive tank, um, which will be, of course, uh, later on uh, in 42 and then later on in the next presentations uh, coming down the line. At the start of September 1941, the garrison was hammered by 100 Stukas and repeated tank attacks were beaten off throughout October. Okay. <clears throat> that month, the Siege of Tobruk entered uh, its sixth month. On the 17th of November, the western desert was lashed by heavy rains. The sands became a sea of mud as units of Lieutenant General Sir Alan Cunningham's newly formed British 8th Army turned forward for Operation Crusader. It was an ambitious plan designed to lure Rommel's armor into battle and relieve Tobruk. On the following day, British tank corps uh, groups gr uh, clashed in driving rain with panzer elements around City Rizé, um, City Rizé, 10 miles southeast of the Tobruk perimeter. And as you can see in this video here, um, they're getting news from all, and of course this is June 22nd, uh, 1941. This is the start of the um, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Eventually, after bitter, bitter fighting with heavy losses on both sides, uh, tough New Zealand infantrymen with fixed bayonets linked up with British uh, Matilda tanks from Tobruk that had uh, battered through the German lines. With bagpipes uh, skirling, uh, relieving troops um, marched into the town on December 10th. On the following day, Prime Minister Churchill, Winston Churchill uh, rose in the House of Commons and triumphantly announced, The enemy, who has fought with the utmost stubbornness and enterprise, has paid the price of his valor. And it may well be that the second phase of the Battle of Libya will gather more easily the fruits of the first than has been our experience so far. Throughout the, the rest of December 1941, Rommel's Africa Corps withdrew westward, skillfully, Thrashing, um, thwarting each British outflanking movement. As Erwin Rommel states, Gentlemen, you have fought like lions and had been led by donkeys. And he states that to uh, British um, officers captured it during the Battle of Tobruk. <clears throat> Rommel, however, was far from being finished. After a five month lull, during which he built up his German and Italian forces, he launched another offensive on 26th of May, 1942. The, pan the German Panzer and infantry formations hit the G uh, line, uh, Gazela line, swung around Berhachim, gallantly defended by a free French uh, fighting force, and battled with British guards and armored units in the cauldron, an area so named because of its relentless heat and the intensity of the fighting there. The Panzers battered their way out of the cauldron, swept northward, and eventually rolled into Tobruk on June 20th. The British, Indian, and South African defenders had fought bravely, but outgunned and outnumbered three to one, were overwhelmed. The Germans took 20, or sorry, 33,000 prisoners and Rommel told a band of captured British soldiers, gentlemen, you have fought like lions and had been led by donkeys. And so that is actually coming up in um, <clears throat> 1942. 
and then just another sneak peek into the future, more or less. Um, of course, but for now, Tobruk is held. So here's a, just a poster of the Rats of Tobruk, Peter Finch. Oh, yeah, there's a movie that's right in the 1960, 1967, The Rats of Tobruk. I actually should see that again. I haven't seen that in a long time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, The Siege of Tobruk. Thank you very much. Aaron Beaumont, Military Specialist for Carlton County.